I'd like to welcome Ellen Erickson from Natural History Museum of Utah. Hi, Ellen. Good morning. Good morning. Um, how, how are things going for you? And uh... <laughs> Wonderful. It's a beautiful day and I am sad to not be seeing you in person. Um, I know. The Though this, this format does allow me to share some, some tech things that I wouldn't have been able to otherwise. So I'm excited to, to share it's, some, some Exactly, <laughs> exactly. The, the regular Bee Fest, I always felt like, well, we're in this, you know, outdoors in the sun and we get a little area of shade um, where people can present like, you know, on poster boards or things, but this, you know, allows us to do something we've never been able to do at Bee Fest before. So I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I think it's an exciting thing. So thanks so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here yeah. today to help kick off the fest. <laughs> yeah, we're so glad that you're helping us kick it off. You're first up and uh, you're going to be giving us a talk about iNaturalist, um, a little demonstration and making buzzworthy um, observations. Um, I'm so excited. I just downloaded the app a couple days ago and um, yeah, it's, it's cool. I mean, everyone talks about this is like, oh, I wish there was an app that does that. And I was like, yeah, there is. But you're going to give us so much more information about, um, you know, everything that's behind this app and more. So I'm really excited. Um, yeah, just kind of stalling a little bit in case, you know, people are still logging on. But um, yeah, hopefully things are good. You all ready to go? Yeah, whenever you guys are, I am. Okay, I'm yeah, I'll, um, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll hand over the, the mic to you. Great, sounds good, sounds good. So I just, as a, as a hello to everyone and maybe a little background on who I am and why I'm talking at Bee Fest this year. I work for the Natural History Museum of Utah as their citizen science coordinator. Um, so I manage the citizen science programs that the museum puts out to the public and, and citizen science really brings together people of all ages and backgrounds, walks of life to engage in the scientific process in some way. Uh, and we also help contribute to museum research that's going on. We have active research projects. And then of course, it's a really fun thing to do. Uh, we're connecting with the world around us and with the people around us too. So the museum's mission is to illuminate the natural world and the place of humans within it. And citizen science is a fabulous tool to get at that. Um, so just so people tuning in know, anyone can be a citizen scientist. That means you right now watching this broadcast from wherever you are, there are projects globally that you could connect with and that need your help. You might be somebody like me who has interest in the natural world, a love of science, but maybe you didn't choose a specific field to explore professionally, um, that's totally fine. <laughs> that doesn't mean you don't have to be part of science or you can't be part of science and that it doesn't have to be part of your life. It very much can be part of your life. Citizen science is a wonderful way to exercise that interest, um, stay up to date on current topics and, and really make contributions to the field. So think about it. Scientists out there need your help right now and it's really easy to get involved and it's super fun. I personally love doing it. Of course, it's part of my job, but I also do it on my own personal time as well, helping other citizen scientists in the state and in other places in the world. The museum, the Natural History Museum of Utah has several active projects right now that you could get involved in. Um, and I'll speak a little bit about those through, through my talk. And those are all viewable on our website nhmu.edu slash citizen science, or actually slash citizen dash science. <laughs> That's the website. Um, and I'm sure that'll get posted in, in the chat. So just so you know, my plan for today is to sort of introduce uh, this tool that I frequently use during my job called iNaturalist. And I'll share how you can start even this afternoon, collecting citizen science data on bees or really any other wild living thing for that matter um, that you happen to come across. So I'll sort of go over what the basics of iNaturalist are, why it's great, how you can use it, and then how you can be making the best possible, maybe even buzzworthy 
uh, observations on iNaturalist. Um, so there'll be plenty of time to sort of ask questions and I really love this to be open. So don't feel shy, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, I'd love for this to be an interactive thing. And, and as Sophie mentioned, the Catalyst team is monitoring YouTube um, for questions that I can help answer. Um, I'll do my best. <laughs> and really, whether you're new to iNaturalist or maybe you know about it already and you use it frequently, um, I really think there'll be something for everyone in this presentation. So stay tuned. We'll have a lot of fun. I'll share some slides. I'll share some screen captures from my, my tablet and some live views of me making an observation for you, um, and it'll be pretty fun. So I'm excited to get into it. So Sophie, if you, if you think it's good, I'll just start jumping into some slides to start off with now. Yeah, definitely. I just wanted to um, tell everyone who's watching um, to remind everyone in case you're watching the embedded version on um, slcbfest.com. Um, I am actually not sure if you can chat directly from that embedded version. So if, if you're not seeing where the, the chat is, um, I think you can just go straight over to Catalyst's YouTube channel and that's where you'll see the chat on the right hand side um, to ask your questions. We've um, we're, we got a whole team um, monitoring that, like Ellen said. So um, yeah, feel free to ask away. Um, and we're excited to you know, have this interactive portion of the fest. So yeah, take it away, Ellen. Awesome, sounds great. Let's see if I can get my PowerPoint up for you and then we'll do a little screen share. Okay, so this should be my title slide. Cool. Um, okay, so here we go. Making buzzworthy observations with iNaturalist. Uh, this is something I am super nerdy about. I love doing it on my own time. I also great, like very gratefully get to do it as part of my job as well and inspire people to do iNaturalist observations. So I'm thrilled to be talking about that um, with you. Um, so again, back to citizen science programming at the Natural History Museum. Um, really citizen science is sort of rooted in community uh, and people are central to all of that. Um, we're passionate about the natural world and maybe it, maybe some of you had the chance to come see one of our recent exhibits at the museum called Nature All Around Us. Um, the exhibit was focused on local nature here in Utah. It had a lot of wonderful citizen science components to it, um, which was pretty special. And that exhibit recently wrapped up at the museum and is actually beginning a 10 year national tour. It's off to Minnesota to start off with, which is pretty exciting. Um, so we'll be spreading spreading the love of the power of community and, and our local ecosystems um, as we go. Um, so really citizen science needs people and it's all about crowdsourcing ideas and knowledge, observations and skills um, of the public. Citizen scient or scientists really can use your eyes, your ears, your hands um, and, and your knowledge to help advance their research. And so if you imagine uh, being a researcher, say studying bees, and you are hoping to capture as many um, photos or, or even specimens of say the Western honeybee as you possibly can, as one researcher, you only have so much ability to go out and do that sort of thing. The more people you have helping, the more data you can collect. And so the power of community really is people coming together to help um, answer these research questions that are, that are coming out um, and, and can sometimes collect specimens and like I said, photographs for, for people. Um, at the museum, here's our, our website for citizen science or that's the, um, the link. There's several research projects that we have going on related to citizen science. We're looking at fox squirrels, which is an introduced species of tree squirrel in the valley. Another introduced species of insect called the European firebug. You can um, help us with transcribing field note records. Uh, these are scanned files of, of field notes that have been digitized from research um, going back to like the 1930s, maybe even earlier. And um, as you can see, maybe you can see on this slide here that the, the, the script is a little bit um, tricky. People wrote that there's, there's a lot of scribbled writing. And so we need help uh, looking at these and transcribing what the notes say. So then um, the, the notes can be digitally uh, searched and utilized, which is a pretty exciting thing. So citizen scientists are helping with that. 
we have citizen scientists looking for fireflies across Utah and actually across the West. Yes, fireflies are here in Utah. Um, they're not here right now. They're sort of a late spring, early summer thing to come to see. And you can look more uh, on our website for that, but we very much depend on citizen scientists to help us spot fireflies. Um, we don't have any active projects specifically focused on bees right now, but we do a lot of wonderful biodiversity research uh, and, and collection of biodiversity knowledge. And in our 2020 field season, which obviously has been a little weirder than the typical year, because um, we're not interacting with people in person, we've been doing a lot of uh, you know, distance connection with people. We've still managed to collect over 8,200 observations. It's photographs of biodiversity in the state of over 1,000 different species, which is pretty amazing. All of that is using da, 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 the iNaturalist platform. Um, so iNaturalist really is an amazing tool. It's an it's a online database that the Natural History Museum of Utah had nothing with the creation of. It was, it started in um, California and it was basically started, well, I guess at its core, it's this online database that, that catalogs photographs of wild living things. The platform really was designed for members of the public like you and like me to capture biodiversity data, photograph it, um, and then that data becomes freely available to anybody, researchers and the public alike. Uh, and that really helps educate, um, obviously, researchers sometimes and can aid their research. But then as users, you and I also get to learn about things. And so you're outside, you're on a walk, you see something, you take a photograph of it. iNaturalist is going to help you learn what that thing is. And so the next time you see it, you know what what's going on. And so I can get into the details of that a little bit more. Basically, in a nutshell, to use iNaturalist, you are outside, you could be in your house too, and you see something that is wild and living, plant, animal, insect, um, and you take a photo of it. Then you share that photo to the platform. You can do it via a, a free mobile app, which is what I use most frequently on my phone. You can also do it online through a website platform that they have. Um, and then once you post that observation, it becomes available and viewable to the iNaturalist public. And so people then help you um, identify what it is that you found. So really you're seeing nature, you're taking a photo of nature, you're adding that photo to iNaturalist, and you're contributing to science. That's sort of the super, super simplistic version of what iNaturalist is. Um, so say you were at, uh, maybe you were joining the Natural History Museum at a BioBlitz event, which is where we're trying to collect as much data as we can about a specific place. Um, the Fife Wetland is an example of a location we've held multiple BioBlitzes to try to photograph as much data as we can. As you walk around, you might see a photo, you might see this, in, an insect crawling around, you might see a plant, uh, guaranteed you'll see these sorts of things. Each individual species would be its own observation on a naturalist. And then, um, and so you would photograph one thing, save that, that's an observation. Then you go to the next thing, photograph that, save it, and that becomes an observation. Um, and so, you wouldn't ever add all of these things into one unified observation because that becomes sort of confusing. Think of one observation on iNaturalist as being the record of one thing at a specific time in a specific place. Um, and I'll get more into the specifics of what that kind of looks like for all of you. Um, okay. iNaturalist is a credible site. It's an incredible site as well and they have um, some pretty exciting milestones. They just recently, within the past month, reached 50 million observations globally, which is pretty wild. That's a lot of biodiversity data. That means 50 million different observations of, of wild living things across the globe that people have been photographing, which is pretty awesome. Um, the site started in 2012, if that gives you any kind of reference of, when, um, of how much data is being collected. Um, and of those 50 million observations, this is a graphic that the website put out uh, when they announced this awesome milestone. Um, the, 
top three sort of species categories that people tend to observe on iNaturalist are plants, insects, and then birds are the top three things that people are seeing. Um, and likely because those are things that are around a lot um, and people maybe know a lot about and they're easy to photograph sometimes. <laughs> um, so let's see here. Oh, and then here we have some observations by country. And so the United States has the majority of observations being made with lots of countries um, and other places worldwide sort of growing their iNaturalist um, interactions, which is pretty great. Let's see, what do I have after that? Okay, so that's too far. So let's go into the iNaturalist website. And I'll show you a little bit more about what I mean. So on the main page here, uh, this is the global record of all of the observations ever made. You can see here, they're already up to 51 million observations, getting close to 52, pretty exciting. Um, so all of these red dot jumbles represent species that have been observed over 29. Hey, Ellen. Yeah. Um, I think you're still on your um, slideshow screen share. Awesome. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> As you can see here, you're viewing a slide I'm not talking about at all. <laughs> I was like, I don't think I see any red dots over there. <laughs> Thanks, Sophie. Yeah. OK, so here we are. Um, thank you. I had that hyperlink to my presentation and didn't think it would not jump over with my viewing. So here's the main page of iNaturalist here. Um, and so we're on the explore setting. And so these are all of the observations that have been made. And so as I said, here you can see they're already up to 51 plus million observations, which is amazing. So the iNaturalist site is really cool because also not only is it capturing all of this data, but we as, as, as users or just the public, you don't have to have an account. This is just through their website. Um, I'm not logged in. Um, actually, I think I am logged in, but even if I wasn't, you could still view this. You can search this data. So we can look in Utah and say, okay, 51 plus million observations globally. How about in Utah? How many do we have? Um, looks like we've got about over 200,000 of them, which is pretty wonderful. So the state here is all packed in all of these fabulous observations. Um, and then of the species um, that we see in Utah, there we've got over 7,000 different species of wild living things that people have found in the state. Um, and I'm seeing here on this, this is a kind of an interesting thing to, to showcase. We've got um, lots of plants here that have been photographed and someone also took this picture of a pumpkin. So the site really is designed to capture wild living things. And so, you know, what are the things that are naturally existing in the ecosystem? That's what's interesting from a data standpoint as a researcher. Um, and, you know, when we're really talking about recording biodiversity on a global scale, when we're recording things that have been cultivated, planted by people. So something like this pumpkin was most likely uh, planted by a human and farmed by a human. It's not existing in the, in the ecosystem naturally. And so this is an example of a, of a post that you could make, obviously it's accepted by the site, but it's not necessarily useful. And so as a user, um, I, I think it's really great to think about the kinds of posts that you're making and really recognizing that recording wild species are really important. Um, and actually this is taking, this is on a little bit of a tangent, but maybe I'll just talk about it a little more since we're here. Yeah. Um, but thinking about that as a, as somebody who's photographing things. I think there's some sort of, the, you know, there are questions of like, what do, do I photograph this? Do I photograph that? What's good for a naturalist? I think when in doubt, put it on the site. Data is great. So don't ever be like, this is good, this is bad. Um, if you're out on a walk and you see somebody's dog running through the wilderness, or you've got your own dog on a hike and they're looking pretty cute, those are fabulous photos to take. Again, not really the best iNaturalist data. That's not a wild thing um, that's interacting with the ecosystem and, and I think a scientifically meaningful way. Um, but say you, and so maybe to get back to these pumpkins. So the pumpkins, like, so we know those pumpkins were growing here, um, but somebody planted them. You have the ability to, in an observation say, okay, this is something that's captive, it's cultivated, it's not wild. Um, and if it's not wild, that means it's not gonna become useful data for anybody and that's fine. Um, so 
that's something you can do is label it as such. Um, but something interesting that maybe, so maybe you have a garden around your house, plants that you've planted, I certainly do, um, because they look nice, they make me feel happy, it gives me something to do in the summertime, sometimes too much to do in the summertime. Um, a lot of those things are, are cultivated plants that I have specifically put there, they're not occurring naturally. I'm not gonna put those on a naturalist, but cultivated plants do, especially since we're talking about bees, attract pollinators, they're attracting things to them. And so wild things can be interacting with those um, non-native species. And so I think that's really, I think it's an important thing to note is that um, maybe you planted um, some beautiful dahlias in your yard. Uh, those dahlias are not fabulous to put on a naturalist because they're not wild, but any insects that happen to be interacting with that dahlia are perfect examples of things to put on a naturalist. And, and interesting, to, to note, you know, hey, this is not a native, a native species, this is something I planted, um, but look at all these, these things that live here that still want to interact with it. Anyway, so I, I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself, but I think that's an interesting thing to note. Um, yeah, no, that's important because that's my first, that was kind of my first question, like, oh, well, I have, you know, different things I see in the garden that I want to know, or in, in Greta, the editor of Catalyst's Garden, she's got so many cool things growing that I never know the names of, but yeah. Totally. It, <laughs> that's it's right good to that's know right. that but you can you should you can mark it as cultivated or um yes. and I can show you, you should okay cool yeah yeah I can show yeah. you how to do that when when I, I'll, I'll do an example um observation so you okay can cool because I have a, a picture of a thing that was growing in her yard that when it gets to that I'm excited it looks like a little baby red pumpkin and I I can't remember what Greta said it was but it was it was so cool and I, I'm like, well, I want to try that out because I just want to know what it is. So yeah, yeah. Well, and that's a really so that's a really fabulous thing about what iNaturals can do, and I honestly can't speak to its ability to identify, um, you know, non wild things. But frequently, mm -hmm. I'm out on a hike. Maybe I'm just in my yard. Maybe I'm walking through the neighborhood and I'm seeing a bird. I'm seeing a weed. I'm seeing some sort of an insect crawling around. I'm like, oh, what is that? Yeah, and I, I take a photo of it and I put it on iNaturalist and you know the year and a half that I've personally been using it I have learned so much more about the things that I'm seeing outside all the time and it's really me like I already was sort of a naturalist as a, like a, an amateur naturalist sort of you know somebody who knew yeah. a little bit about a lot of things and certainly was interested in the natural world but iNaturalist I, I really has helped me learn about stuff more uh, which has been pretty fun. And again, not an expert in any specific sort of taxa, but I do, I do really enjoy it. And it's really empowered me to kind of know more about what's hanging out in my yard. Yeah. Um, and I found some pretty special things out there that make me think of my yard in, in a different way. And, um, and, and we found that too, with some of our programming there, um, there actually was a species of dragonfly that was photographed at the Fife wetland along the, the Jordan river, um, which is one of Salt Lake city's um, park locations. And we were doing a joint mm -hmm. bio book with them to help collect data for the parks department um, for trails and natural lands. And somebody photographed this dragonfly species, um, which turns out is a, a threatened species of dragonfly. And so the city in that location no longer sprays for weeds. They actually pull weeds. Pulling weeds is, weeds is a lot, um, it's, it's less um, aggressive and, and um, it's, it's not as harmful to insect populations as spraying is. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a direct result of a citizen scientist taking a photo of something that they had no idea was a threatened species of dragonfly. They just saw it and took a photo of it. Um, and it became some really useful data, which is pretty cool. So you never know what you might be finding and you never know what it might, what the impact of that might be. And again, yeah. I'm getting it myself, but it's kind of an exciting thing like, okay, robins we see outside all the time and magpies we see outside all the time uh, and so you know that's an example of something that like you, you can take a picture of it and put it on an eye trust if you want to I do some people don't because they're so common um, but for other things especially if it's something you're like gosh I haven't seen that before adding it to a naturalist really can be pretty cool um, because it, it could mean a lot to science uh, and iNaturalist has some pretty amazing examples of that globally where people have found species living in places that science had no idea they were there or people have photographed species um, that have never been photographed before ever and they just wow. saw 
a moth, took a picture of it, um, you know, and then the moth researchers rejoiced because here's a person who happened to see something really amazing that they weren't able to. <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, so maybe with that, I'll just get into some screen shares of how to make an observation on a naturalist. Um, so this is just sort of a basic, how do you get started? Um, or if you already have this started, how do you, um, how do you become an active engaged user in the site? So um, you should be seeing my tablet screen here. Yep, we see Fabulous. it. So I mentioned that, so we were just looking at the, the website platform for iNaturalist, a really amazing place. That's where you can search data. That's where you can find all this amazing stuff. The mm -hmm. app is not as easy to do that. You can still search stuff, but the website is better. Um, but what the app is really amazing for doing is making observations. Um, so it's available, I'm using a, a Mac product or an Apple product, this is an iPad, but iNaturalist is also available on Android. It works super well on Android. The interface looks a little bit differently than, than it does here. So if you have an Android and you're seeing that my screen looks different than yours, that's okay um, to make. So when you first get onto the app and this will do this on an Android too, it's gonna show you observations that have been made. So this is the Natural History Museum citizen science account that we use for outreach events when we're doing things sort of publicly, um, which we, we haven't done this year. So we don't have, um, a lot of updated or a lot of new observations that have been made here. Um, down at the bottom, I assume you can see my cursor. Let's see if I can do. Yeah, I can see your cursor. Cool, let's make it a little brighter. Okay, so here's my little red dot. So down here it says observe. And if you are on an Android, yours will have a little green plus sign. That's how you add an observation. Um, so I select observe. And automatically it's going to, oh, I'm doing it on my screen on my computer. That's not going to work. So automatically it's going to take me to a camera. Um, so if you want to take a photo in that moment, you can. Uh, what I prefer to do is take photos using the camera app on my phone. Um, so go into, uh, you'd select this. There we go. And you can see photos that you've taken in the past. And so this allows me uh, to really kind of nerd out with my camera, take all these pictures in rapid succession, sort of zoom in, um, and, and then I can take the pictures I like best and upload those to iNaturalist. If you're just doing it from that photo app on iNaturalist, it, um, you can only do sort of one at a time, which can be tricky if you have an insect that <laughs> is moving around a lot. So I can go in and then maybe select some images that I'd like to find. So let's see, let's make observations of this honeybee right here. So here's a, a picture that we took of our insect. Uh, so I've selected it, I would say next. A really cool thing about the platform is that it captures multiple photos. And so I think it's six, eight, I don't actually remember what the number is, but you can add more than one photo. So I could go in and I happen to have taken more than one picture of that insect. And so I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna select another photo. The airplane's taking a little while to catch up to the thing. Come on, little iPad. Oh, it's mad at me now. We'll reconnect. Okay, so we're back. Sorry, tablet is mad. So I added a second photo in there, just so you can see. Then what I would do, so if I wanted to add another photo, I'd select this plus button and I could go in and add more. Then a really cool thing, I think my favorite thing about iNaturalist is this section. What did you see? The app does this for you. The website platform does this for you too. You can add observations to the website as well. Um, so if I select this, it's going to give me some suggestions of what I've seen. And a lot of that is sort of based on the quality and the type of photograph that you've taken. And so this, so the, the app is thinking, perhaps I'm trying to ID a, a, a flower, which is this milkweed that the honeybee is on. 
Um, and so it's giving me maybe some top suggestions like, oh, if we think this is a showy milkweed. In fact, that is a showy milkweed flower that the bee is on. Um, but I know that this is a, was a Western honeybee. Since I know that, that's what I would select. If you didn't know, there's some really great things here on the side that you could select. So maybe you're like, okay, well, I know it's not this plant. I wanna select a bee. This is the first bee it gives me. So if I touch that information bubble, it's gonna hop me over to a thing that shows me lots of pictures of the bee. It's gonna show me a map of where that thing is seen. So if it's showing you a picture of something and there are no dots in Utah or no dots in North America, possibly that's not the right thing. Um, or if you're scrolling through pictures and you're like, whoa, that's not what it looks like at all. Um, then you'd go back and try to find a picture that does match it. Um, I know it's the Western honeybee, so I'll select that. It automatically added the date and the time that I took this. It also automatically geotagged the location of it. So I don't have to enter anything else. Pretty amazing. If you're in a place where you don't want to maybe publicly share where your data is being collected, maybe you're at your home or you found some sort of species that's sensitive, you don't want to share the exact location of, you can obscure the location, which basically just means when someone sees the map, it'll be sort of a bubble area of where something was observed, not the specific pinpoint of the location, or you could also make it private. Um, but I'm all for open data and I'm not worried about this, so I would leave it open. And then Sophie here is where you would change it to being captive or cultivated. So here, if you select this, it's gonna give you the option to say yes or no. Um, and no, I did not cultivate this bee. Um, though I know, people, I know people could maybe feel, especially with honeybees, uh, Western honeybees, um, I can see how you would maybe wonder, is it captive, is it cultivated? And I think you know, because people have hives, I guess that's sort of up to you as a user. I was in a place where I was not by a hive that somebody had in their yard. Um, so I feel pretty comfortable saying that, no, this is not. Um, yeah. We're cultivated. Hey, I have a question from one of our viewers that's related to, you know, this picture with a bee on a flower and how it brought up both Yes. Um, species. What is the best way to observe that? Because you said that, you know, the, the scientists collecting this data want to know what flowers are bringing certain pollinators. Should we do these in two separate entries or can, is there a way to do it together? Great. So the way iNaturalist functions is if you're wanting to record separate species, always make them separate observations. So absolutely record the bee and then record the milkweed. And that is like without the bee picture, without the bee in the picture, or like. Well, so I think it's fine if it's in the picture. Yeah. So that's a good question. You could even use very similar photos, and I've done this absolutely because that's also interesting data. Uh, you know, what is this bee hanging out on? Uh, what kind of yeah. what plants is it interacting with? Or you know, vice versa. What what species of insect are interacting with this plant? And so in this case, and actually, this is exactly what I did. Um, I, and I didn't put all those pictures on, on this tablet here because I had taken them with my phone. But so what I did was make an observation of the Western honeybee as I was showing you, save mm -hmm. that, it becomes the data point. Then I made a separate observation of the milkweed and I took different, some different pictures. So I had a, a zoomed out shot of the whole milkweed itself, basically a ways to capture, um, to prove that it was a milkweed. And I'll get into this also, but um, you could make an iNaturalist observation of just that picture with the bee and the showy milkweed flower and, and say, this is a showy milkweed. Um, it's tricky because it's not like all of, it's not the whole picture of what that species is. And so the more right. of the species itself you can show the better. And so the, that zoomed in picture of the honeybee is ideal for the honeybee because that's what I'm trying to show is the honeybee uh, and yeah. give as much proof that that's what I'm seeing. Um, and, and I'll show you why. But fabulous, yeah. fabulous question. And I'll, I'll keep explaining this. So hopefully that becomes a little more clear the more. Yeah, that yeah. I'm curious if there's a way, like if there's a spot on there for you to note what's like, or to tag a, a species that, it, you know, the plant that this honeybee is attracted to or any other bug for that matter. Um, yeah. Cause I know it's probably yeah. hard to get a picture of just a bee because usually when it's still enough for us to take a picture of, it's yes. landed on something that it likes, but uh, yeah. That's, That's exactly right. So in this case, with the show, knowing there's a showy milkweed, what I would do is in this notes section, I would say, you could type in here and say, um, 
on showy milkweed. And look at me do, being, doing a really great job tapping <laughs> the tablet um, on showy milkweed. Um, and you know, this cool. is another place where you would you could enter in other information. Like it was, you know, there were there were many of these species available. There or you're around flying around, or you can make other notes about behaviors that you're seeing. Data wise, this is this is everything. So the photo is the main source of data that you're providing. Right. Uh, labeling it to your best ability is the next thing. If you take a picture of a bee, iNaturalist isn't giving you a very good suggestion of what it is. I'm all for selecting, you know, the, the first bee picture they, that iNaturalist thinks you're seeing. They have this really cool AI feature. It's learning and getting better all the time. I think their current, the, the platform's current claim is that it's about 70% accurate with its ID of your photo, which is pretty good. Um, yeah. That's the next thing. So oh, sorry. So if you if you um, so, but if you're not sure, you're like, oh, it's a, I know it's a B, or I think it's a B. You could also just go in here and select B as an option. So you, maybe you could make it the most um, get as specific as you can. So if you only feel comfortable saying it's a B, great, but label it as a B. When you're making this observation in here, if you leave this section unentered uh, and you just say that it was, it's like it, it leave, leave it unknown, which is the default. When you save it, it goes into this sort of amorphous pool of like unknown observations that no one is looking at. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show why that's important here in just a second. So label it as something to the best of your ability. And then down here, you would say save. I think maybe on an Android, it says add observation. I have my platform set right now, so it's not automatically uploading. I have to manually do that. I do that as sort of a battery saving thing. So if I'm out in the world, this is sort of like a super nerdy iNaturalist tip, but if I'm out in the world and I'm away from Wi-Fi, especially if I'm out on a hike um, and you know I wanna save my battery, if I'm making an observation and it's like churning through my battery to post it live in that moment, it, it's a bummer. Um, so I, I, you can make a setting so it, automatically uploads when you get back to Wi-Fi or that you can manually upload it. So if I select that, um, it's gonna upload it to the site for me. And then you can see down here on the side, um, these little boxes are showing examples of times that um, of previous observations that somebody's interacted with it. So let's collect, let's click on this first showy milkweed because this is kind of applies to this moment that we're talking about here. So here's an observation that we made a little while ago this summer. Um, the observation showcases the photos that were taken. Um, and so I can slide through and look at them. And these, these look like they're kind of bad photos, like they're not showing the whole thing, but they actually are. They're just sort of, if you click on it, it shows the whole thing. So I took a picture of the flower itself, zoomed back, took a picture of the entirety of the plant. Um, it has the species that we thought that it was, it has a little, pinpoint of where that location was. And then you can see down here, when you first make your observation with the B post I just made, it starts off as a casual grade. That means I've made the observation, it's casually up on the website and it's waiting for an ID. You need to have user verification to make your research or your, your observation deemed research grade, which means that people agree with you or they agree with each other that this is what it is and it becomes a research grade quality observation. So if I click on this little, these dots, you can see that when we first posted it, we said it was showy milkweed. And then pretty quickly thereafter, somebody said, oh yes, we agree with that. So two thirds of the people commenting on that agree. So it becomes a research grade observation. That's pretty great. Oh, that's cool. They Hey, so I have a question about yeah. old photos. Um, yes. If you took a photo a while back, can you upload it and then toggle um, and you're not maybe, well, I guess most of our phones now have like a date stamp on photos, but mm -hmm. if you're not sure about uh, the date on something, can you just put that at a later date or say it was, you know, eh, a couple months ago or in 2018 or? Yeah, it's a fabulous question. And absolutely, yes, you can go back and with any archived photos you have, and I mean, honestly, I have some pictures from this summer that I have yet to take, I just haven't gotten in to add them yet. So I, I, I'm behind in some of my posting. 
even from this summer, but there are examples of people loading their photos from the past 20, 30, 40 years on wow. by naturalist. And so of course, if it was done with your phone, super easy because it's, or, you know, with a digital camera, likely the, the, the date uh, was, is somehow geotagged this data, especially with modern things. You've got, so, that it, so you've got that as metadata associated with the photo. And oh, depending cool. on your phone and depending on the camera, um, the location is this, that, that could be the case too, which obviously makes it easier for you because you don't have to do anything, but it, you absolutely can go in and manually enter the date, manually pinpoint to the best of your ability um, where you were on a map. Um, and there, yeah, there are lots of examples of people going back in to do that. So if you have interesting pictures of any kind of nature on your phone, even if you already knew what it was, um, iNaturalist is obviously an amazing way for you to learn about the things that you're seeing, but if you know what it is, um, it's still great to add because that might be useful data to somebody. Maybe it's useful now, maybe it becomes useful in one, two, three, ten years from now, um, especially with shifting climates and species sort of moving and things changing. Um, you know, the things that you're seeing right now, even in your own backyard, might change in the next several years. And so that become that can become really useful data. Like, why is that insect not there anymore? Or gosh, we've really been seeing a big insurgence of this insect since X, Y, and Z. And then, of course, you know, trained scientists come up with these research questions and they can start to look at specific correlations, which is sort of cool. Um, yeah. So a really amazing thing about the platform is that there's this, this engagement with, with other users. And so people can say, yes, Sophie, that is in fact a Robin fabulous observation and they'll help you. You know, if, if that milkweed picture I was showing you, if I mislabeled that, uh, it's, it wasn't a showy milkweed, maybe it was a desert milkweed. Um, somebody can see that and say, no, never mind. It's actually, it's this. And they would suggest something else. And then again, people viewing that uh, would either agree or disagree with that. And, and who's this okay. someone? Are these other users? Are they like scientists? I imagine a bunch of yeah, great question. So it's scientists people. hanging out in the lab telling, no, nope, that's not what that is. <laughs> totally. Well, you know, so when I first started on iNaturalist, I was like, I was like, I don't think I'm really seeing anything cool enough to post. Like, I don't like. Yeah. I, just kind of, I had sort that's of this my like, worry weird feeling about it. And it's, and that, no, that's not the case. Absolutely. Scientists do look at this, not like a whole bunch, but there, I don't, I mean, to my knowledge, there's not this like lab of our natural scientists who are like, Sophie, what a terrible observation. <laughs> um, no, it's not like that. Really. It's mostly people like you, people like okay. me, people who are tuning in, who love maybe a specific sort of species or a specific taxa. People who love bees um, are on iNaturalist and they're only photographing bees or they're only helping ID bees. And so I, if I feel comfortable, can easily go in and see something that you posted um, and help say like, oh yes, like I feel really comfortable, you know, identifying a robin or, um, uh, or there's certain species that I just know about. <laughs> I'm like, oh yes, of course. Like that is a California quail right here in Salt Lake City. Um, and those things tend to get, you know, people tend to verify those th sorts of things pretty quickly. Um, but you know, I, my expertise starts to drop off the more uh, the, the cooler animals get. And so other people who do know about stuff are looking and they're helping you identify. And sometimes you might make yeah. a post and nobody is really making any kind of comment on it. And that's, that's okay, don't worry, someone might get to it eventually. If you really do want somebody who maybe knows about that topic to comment on it, um, here I can do, let me show, I wasn't planning on this either, but let's show. Yeah. Um, I'll show you my, this screen again. Um, okay, so maybe I, yes, no, I'm not logged into this. So maybe I, um, I don't like these pictures here. No, they're lovely pictures, but let's, oh my goodness. Okay, let's click on this. This is a crazy photo. So here's a picture somebody just took recently of, this is not a bee, I apologize. Oh, okay, so Brian Fox, uh, this is someone who's volunteered with the Natural History Museum as a citizen science volunteer, he captured this wild photo of this um, fish jumping out of the water. Amazing timing. He was at the right place at the right time. Um, so he tags it as a European carp and other people have agreed with this. So it's now become a research grade. You can see here it's labeled as being a vulnerable species, which is interesting. So iNaturalist will kind of give you some data on that, but it's also saying it's been introduced. So it's not um, native. Anyway, interesting side note. Um, that is interesting. So maybe he posts and nobody's commenting. He's like, oh, I really want someone to see this carp. 
So he could click on European carp here um, and it's gonna take you to sort of like the general page on the European carp and it'll say um, who the top observer of the carp are, who the top identifier of carp are. So that means that that's the top person who, that, that's somebody who the most has gone into to people's posts to say, yes, that is a, is a European carp, uh, which means they know, they in theory know something about it. So you could um, copy this person's handle and go back to your own post and say, you can, oops, sorry, too far. Whoa. It's thinking about it, but there's a comment section um, if it ever shows itself again. Uh, you could, there's a little comment section where you would say, you could say, at Sophie Silverstone or whatever that person is, what do you think this is? Um, and it'll tag them. So then they'll get a little notification and they'll look at your observation. And I've oh, certainly done that. that when I've seen something cool, you know, with 51 um, million observations and growing, you know, there's a lot of stuff cycling through the site all the time. And, and the majority of people who are using iNaturalist are uh, people like me who are photographing things, saving them, feeling really cool because I'm learning and I'm sharing and it's great. F fewer people are actually going in to say, okay, yes, what is Ellen taking photos of? And oh, yeah. yes, the Western honeybee. Oh, no, that is a hunt's bumblebee. Oh, no, that's a that's you know some kind of a wasp. Yeah. If um, you want those it. people are really important. So if anyone here is watching and you don't know about iNaturalist, um, or you haven't learned about it before, but you do have knowledge of a specific species or an area of interest like bees, um, log on to iNaturalist. It's free to sign up with an account and you could become somebody, you, any of us can go in and be somebody who helps ID observations. And again, do it to the best of your ability. Don't just like, oh yeah, this is probably what it is. Um, but if you really feel confident that that's what that is, make those suggestions because that's what makes the site really rich and full of data. And so obviously step one is making the observation or seeing the thing and making the observation of it. And then the, the next steps after that are people helping to verify what you've seen um, and and make it a research grade observation. And actually, Sophie, that's the next portion of my little PowerPoint is to kind of get into um, the specifics of how to make a good bee observation um, or a good iNaturalist observation in general, because it's a little more than just taking a photo and uh, hitting save, which is fine, but um, I think there are ways that, that you could be making more quality observations. And I'd love to share that with you if you're interested. Um, so here we are. We're interested. <laughs> We're interested. <laughs> um, so the general iNaturalist tips of taking, making great observations, and this is of any wild living thing you happen to be seeing, obviously having clear photos of the thing is best. iNaturalist is based in photographic data. So if you have a clear photo, that's good. Here we have an example of the same plant species, one that's pretty blurry, the background is busy, there's a bunch of grass, the camera doesn't know what to focus on. And so you can post this, of course, this you know, could potentially be some data, oops, wrong thing, um, but really this is not telling you much about what this plant is. You can kind of see some things, but it's, it's hard. Um, this picture, same plant, the person moved, so there's a different background, it was easy to focus in on it. This is a lot easier to see the shape of these flowers and what the stem looks like and that makes it more identifiable to somebody who knows about plants. Um, clear photos are amazing. Get as close as you can. That's another important thing. Um, so really make it obvious what you're photographing. And so as an example, like maybe you're out on a hike, you see some kind of flying insect and you take a photo. This is a gorgeous photo of scenery, but like, what are you trying to make an observation of? Is it the sagebrush? Is it some pinion pines that are there? Is there, is there a moth hiding somewhere or a fox? I don't know. So this is an example of a gorgeous photo, but a really poor one for an iNaturalist an natural, an observation. You want to be sharing a photo that is very obviously a thing. Um, and so getting as close in as you can, if possible, is important. Patience is a huge thing with taking iNaturalist observations. Sometimes you know, you're out and you see a thing and like I happen to have my phone app out. I, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but it's true. I am a super nerd with this. And so like, I will go out on hikes and like have my phone app just open and be like, oh, like waiting, like, oh, there's a red tailed hawk, or like I'm ready to, because I'm like going out with the purpose of photographing things. Um, nerdy. 
<laughs> but sometimes I love it. I love it. <laughs> but you know, sometimes if you're wanting to meet, especially if you're looking for a specific thing, really being patient to, to wait for something um, is 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 a, a fun skill too. And I, I of course can do that too. So I'll go out and maybe I know there's a plant that has yes, the sun starts to heat up, it'll shine, and I know the pollinators start to come in. So I'll just sit there and, and take pictures of things sort of as they come in. Um, and you know, especially with bees, sometimes they come in and they go to another flower. And so just kind of being patient to follow them around and you know, do the best you can to photograph them. Um, another, so, oh, and then I, so, oh, okay. I don't have a picture with that. Um, and then another, another important thing I think is to take multiple, multiple photos. This really is fabulous for data. And here's why, this is what I mean by multiple, multiple photos, especially as it relates to bees. So, you know, depending on what the species of bee is, there are over, over a thousand catalog, scientifically cataloged species of bees in the state. Some of them look kind of similar to each other. Some of them might look similar to another species entirely, like a hoverfly or a, a wasp. And so um, there are some key things that you, if you're able to capture, really help the, the bee people know. And actually, so a lot of this, this content that I'm about to share with you came from fellow insect lovers who are on iNaturalist making identifications of things that are being shown. So I'd love to, I really want to give a shout out to Cody Bedke, who is one of my iNaturalist volunteers at the Natural History Museum. Cody is amazing and has provided some fabulous um, suggestions for how to make some of these observations be uh, buzzworthy <laughs> and also to Christy Bills who's the entomology collections manager at the museum um, who was helpful in this as well. So taking a dorsal view is really important that's sort of like if if it's like crawling if you've got a bee that's crawling around right in front of you on the table being able to take a picture right straight down on its back um, is, is really fabulous that's going to show body shape that can really help identify certain species definitely help distinguish it between say a bee and a wasp for example uh, potentially. Um, it shows banding patterns of, in, of what color is doing, the color changes that are happening throughout the body, and it can also show um, the shape of, of their head. And potentially that could be, that can be a really good angle to see antenna. All of those can be very specific identifying qualities that if you, um, like, like I know it's a bumblebee, but I'm not sure which bumblebee unless I have specific info. Um, getting a dorsal view is, can be really, really important in that. Um, another important angle to get is lateral view. Uh, another side note, all these pictures that I'm sharing with you here are taken from iNaturalist, some of them by me, some of them by other amazing users on the platform who captured some gorgeous photos. Um, yeah, those are really nice photos. There's some nice Jeez. ones for sure. I mean, those people, all those people are, are, are um, they're, they're all here. I've got them all cited and, and the websites to, the, to these specific posts are, are posted here. Yeah, yeah, are they those phone cameras? Man, those are- No, I actually don't know. I'm not sure with the, with the photo, with, with any picture I take, yes, it's my, it's my iPhone, but um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Um, so lateral view, getting a, so a view of from the side of their body can be super important. That shows again, more color banding. Um, it can help show more f features, especially on the face um, and definitely their legs. Um, and then potentially pollen collecting here is you know, bees and pollen are, are an important <laughs> synergistic thing. Um, and, and sometimes where bees are storing and collecting pollen can showcase, can really, can really confirm what species that is. And so getting, um, getting an angle when possible can be really helpful. Other interesting things to take photos of if you're able to, these are trickier, but a face uh, is, is a, can be a really cool, helpful thing to, again, verify you're seeing a specific thing, more color markings that might show features, um, different physical features of their face. Again, it might show the antenna um, and eye shape can be really important. That varies, especially if, it, if people are wondering, like, is it a bee? Is it a wasp? Is it a fly? Eye shape can be, is often critical in helping um, or, or can be a really helpful thing to showcase and, and verify what you're seeing. Um, and then wings can be another important thing to showcase as well as it pertains to bees. Maybe it's the cells on their wings in terms of number, but also shape. Um, and then also the presence of, of hairiness. That's like, and some, so some of these things are like macro photography um, of, a, of an insect that's really um, still. <laughs> uh, we went over this briefly earlier, utilizing the notes section in iNaturalist is amazing. So 
if you can't um, photograph it, recording those quote behaviors are pretty helpful. So if, you've, if you're seeing a bunch of the same species or a lot of things flying around, make note of that. Um, in things that it's doing, like is it going to each flower and the plant? Is it does it seem to only be going to a specific species of plant? Um, that kind of data can be really helpful in potentially identifying what it is, but also might just be useful data to somebody who is looking at this post at some point. Um, and then other notes on habitat: what plants are they interacting with? Um, again, you adding a photograph of the of the plant too. So if you have a picture of a milkweed, put that in there also. Um, but within the, the honeybee post, but then make a separate post of the, of the milkweed too, I think. Um, and then, you know, is it nesting? Like if you're observing it, are you seeing it flying into the ground? Are you seeing it fly over to a different space? That can be really helpful too, because as most of you, I suspect, know or, 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 or learning, uh, bees you know, aren't all just hanging out in, in nice honeycomb things in our backyards. They live in lots of different places like trees, um, other little cavities in wood, the ground, there are a whole bunch of places. And so that can be helpful inter information. Something else I like to think of when I'm making observations is imagine that you're somebody trying to make an ID of an insect. So you know, if I just like a honeybee is flying by, I'm gonna take the best picture I can. Of course, I'm gonna add that uh, if I feel like it's you know, somehow, I bet, you know, if it has some identifiable features, but if you're able to take more photos, think about what would be useful to people. And this goes across any, any taxa, anything you're wanting to observe on a naturalist. If it's a plant, like it's great to have a picture of just the beautiful flower, but that's not the whole story of that species. We need to really show the entirety of the plant, stem shape, leaf shape, how the leaf is positioned on the plant. There are lots of things about that plant that would help somebody say, oh yeah, that's definitely a showy milkweed. Um, some general photography tips, I think. Um, some people, I don't do this personally. Um, I'm sort of more of like a, I just kind of, I'm like a why, I'm just, I'm just out there. I'm just observing things in a wild setting and I, I get the photos that I can get and I try to take the time to get them. Other people will, will catch bees um, or other insects and you know, with netting and they'll have some sort of receptacle to put them in. Um, I've heard of people bringing ice into the field with them to kind of put their little, their little insect friend you know, in, their, in, a, in a jar or whatever on ice for a couple minutes. The colder they are, the slower they move, which makes them easier to photograph at the angles that you want in clear ways. Um, some people, if they're at home, will stick them in the fridge again for a few minutes just to kind of slow them down so they're easier to photograph and then re-release them into the wild. That's definitely an option if you're interested. Um, be mindful of the lighting and the background too, so that a plant, the picture of a plant I show you, like if, you, if there's a way you can get a better angle to, to showcase something, um, try it. Um, or, you know, if you can get the, the light to show a little better, great. Or if there are times of day that are just better for your device to take photos on, um, you know, like morning light or maybe it likes bright midday light or the shade or you know whatever um, and you kind of learn about that the more you go um, and then equipment I really like I, I take I'm exclusively using my cell phone and so um, you really can take great photos with a phone so don't shy away from that of course you can take amazing photos with with DSLRs and other with other cameras and there are many wonderful examples of that on iNaturalist and, and you can't upload those from your phone if you take them with a digital camera you'll upload those through the platform. And then of course, have a great time. It's really fun to go out. It's a great excuse to get yourself outside, learn a bit more about things you're seeing. And if you have friends who are sort of nerdy about it too, go walking with them and take this, like take the solo walk. I have friends that I can call and I know that you know we'll make it maybe a mile on a walk because we're all like in the bushes, like, oh, I found this, I found that. And we're just <laughs> things. And that's a fun thing to share with people. I love that. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, so for people who want to get better at IDing, um, are there other resources that maybe you've built your knowledge base from, or, um, or just kind of going through the app and looking at finding people who are good at IDing stuff and like kind of following those people? Um, we'd love to put some more resources up on the BeeFest website, um, so people can, yeah, like, nerd out and get as good at IDing as you are. Um, yeah, what are you? Or, you know, and I am certainly not, I am not a pro with IDing by any stretch, but I do know people who are, who are pretty great at it and they would tell you they're not pros too. Um, 
but you know, it's, it's, but it's a fun you thing. Those are humble, humble citizen scientists, oh. you know, much more than, I mean, yeah, <sighs> I wouldn't know what I'm IDing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so it's in, in, in some part of it, you know, for me, it really has been sort of a learned thing. Just sort yeah. of, it's, and so I really, I, Sophie, I'm not an expert in any specific thing. And so I just kind of have learned from like, like making posts of bees that were really not that useful. And, and someone saying to me, you, if you, if you're able, you know, get a better dorsal picture of that bee, or like, can you get a full, a more full picture of their abdomen? That's going to help with some color banding. That's how I'll know which bumblebee species it, is, species it is. That's how I've learned to kind of get better. Do I still make observations that are totally perfect? Of course, and that's fine. Um, the, you know, it, it, make the best observation you can. And I think a really important thing with a naturalist is don't be super stressed out about it. Have fun with it. You see yeah. stuff, post the best, the best pictures you can. I have pictures, like I have some observations that I'm super proud of. Like, oh, this is fabulous. You can see everything. And it was an amazing location and the lighting was so good. But I also have other observations that are like, they're, you know, they're the silhouette of a bird flying in the sky. And for me, I'm like, oh, well, okay. But, um, yeah. but for bird people who know about birds, sometimes a silhouette is all you need. Um, and wow. so, so it's an interesting, so just you know, don't, don't worry. And yeah. I naturalist generally, like I, I personally haven't experienced anyone sort of shaming me or it really mostly <laughs> fun. And like, it makes it so exciting when someone's like, oh, this is a cool photo. And, and yeah. that happened to me personally, and it really makes you so excited. Yeah. So if, if you're interested in getting better at IDs, I think, I, I, I think it kind of like the more observations you make, that helps you kind of maybe understand how to make IDs better. And the more you're IDing, I think that helps you make ops more, makes you, helps you make more quality observations, if that makes sense. So it's good to, I think, yeah. your hand at both to kind of understand what people are doing on both sides. But if really, if you're interested in, say, a specific anything, yeah. um, like for example, we have a, a volunteer at the museum named Rebecca Ray, who is an amazing um, naturalist of all kinds, but specifically is very interested in spiders. She um, self-taught, essentially through iNaturalist, uh, uh, she's an expert in spider identification. And she cool. is, the iNaturalist site has, has deemed her a curator, which means that you know, she does a lot of quality verifications of species on the site. And that's not something that iNaturalist holds lightly. They, they give that um, classification to people uh, in very special ways. And so she, she lives right here in Salt Lake City. Um, and so she's a spider expert. And so if I have spider questions, I'm, t I'm tagging her. Um, I'm noticing things that she's observing. And, and so I've learned some things just from paying attention to her. So you're totally right in saying that, you know, if you're interested in something, find people on iNaturalist who are interested in those things too. And, and yeah. you, collect, you can connect with them and have conversations with them. It's a kind of, it's, it's different, but it's kind of like social media for, for nature nerds in a way too. Yeah, I love it. Because you're connecting with people and nature all at the same time. Absolutely. <laughs> And contributing to science, how? Yeah, hmm. yeah. Well, um, I we're um, we're at time. We're a little over time, and I actually planned for to go a little over time um, because the rest of the presentations for the day are um, it just worked out. Um, if we start a little, you know, th this talk goes on a little longer. Um, but I have a question for you that was asked at the beginning of it. Maybe you know, and maybe you know someone who would help us find out. Um, uh, the question was about um, squirrels in Utah. Because um, I know that iNaturalist came about, you know, not that long ago, but I do, as far as IDing them, because they're not native to Utah, do you have any idea when and how they were introduced or? So it was this was a question about fox squirrels specifically? Um, just squirrels in general. Squirrels in general. So squirrels, so there are native squirrel species that live in Utah. Oh, they're native. Okay, there's some. There are, there are some in, in, in here in northern Utah. There, there aren't many. There's a, a, a the American red squirrel is a native tree squirrel species. They're small, they're cute, they've got little white bellies, they hang out in trees. That's the native tree squirrel species up here in northern Okay, so there's native ones. Yeah, the, is, the question not, was, t was talking about how um, when uh, Amy um, was a kid. She said that she didn't notice the same, you know, squirrels that she sees now. And right, yeah. so is there totally. a way to find so, that out? 
Yeah, well, so yes, so that's a fabulous question. And so, um, so there is a, there's a newer species of tree squirrel that also now is hanging out in Northern Utah. It's called the fox squirrel. They look very different from American red squirrels. Mm -hmm. They're significantly bigger. They have orange bellies. They have big bushy tails and they're a lot more um, charismatic, I guess you could say. Um, th there's another native species of, of squirrel in Northern Utah called, uh, it's a ground squirrel. Um, and they look, they're sort of similar in size maybe to a fox squirrel, but they hang, ground squirrels are hanging out on the ground and fox squirrels are not, they're up in trees and they have long tails, whereas ground squirrels. The museum is studying them. Eric Rickert is the, uh, curator of zoology at the museum, and he's got a citizen science research project where we look at iNaturalist data. We use iNaturalist spe data specifically to really showcase sort of where people are seeing them. They really were first spotted along the Jordan River, and they've been kind of expanding outwards since then. So anytime you see a if, uh, any squirrel, if you see a squirrel in the state of Utah, take a picture of it, put it on iNaturalist, that's useful data to us. We're certainly cool. curious and like, you know, are American red squirrels and fox squirrels hanging out together? Do they live? Are they like coexisting? We have no idea what the, really what the impact of fox squirrels being here is. We know they're here, we know they're spreading. And so he's, he's really curious about um, learning more about what that means for the ecosystem here. Uh, and so citizen scientists can be contributing data to that by taking pictures on iNaturalist. On the Natural History Museum's website, we also have a whole page all about fox squirrels and there's another data form there. You can submit more detailed observations because I will say something iNaturalist cannot do is record where species are not living, if that makes sense. And so if you go out and right. you try to find a fox squirrel and you don't see anything, that actually could be interesting data and it is useful data to Eric and the museum team. And so our form on the museum's website allows you to say no squirrels here, um, which is helpful because iNaturalist really is all about taking photos of things and really like if there aren't photos in a specific area of a species that necessarily that doesn't mean that species isn't, isn't there that really means that you know, there's no one there t using a naturalist if that makes sense yeah uh, so that's a great question and squir so squirrels I, I I I'm pretty passionate about squirrels and we've got a lot of fun stuff at the museum looking at them and we've got some fun stuff cooking for the the early winter that we'll get into more squirrel stuff so stay tuned Amy and anyone else interested? <laughs> Good yeah. question. Yeah, I thought it was a cool question. Squirrels are so cute, but so crazy, you know, and they just keep getting, the ones in the city just keep getting fatter and fatter and. <laughs> yeah, people I know have mixed feelings about squirrels. They really, it's, yeah. uh, it, some people love them, some people hate them. It's a, uh, and I, I, can't, I like that. They're pretty polarizing. <laughs> yeah. Either way, help us with data collection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, um, can I show you the picture of that little, uh, the, the pump, the orange, the red pumpkin-y thing? Maybe yeah. You... Oh, right. Your photo. Yeah. Great. Um, Cause we've got, we're going to go another well, like a couple, 10 or so minutes, um, to finish up answering questions and then I'll give a spiel. Um, let's see, let me get it up on my phone. Um, Okay. Oh, it says a plugin is required to. Can you, will it, will it let you do it through Wi Fi or Bluetooth? Uh, Hang right. in with us, folks. We're trying a new, a new tech option for Sophie here. Okay. Meanwhile, there's a right outside my window here, like banging around in my yard. <laughs> oh, I, okay. Cool. Okay. Yay. Yeah, I it see did it. it. Success. <laughs> okay. Um, it to me this looks like a red pumpkin. <laughs> Do you know have any clue what what that is? I honestly I have no idea. I, and it's so this is so and you know if if you were going to put this on a naturalist, which again I, this looks like it was something that was planted by her specifically. Yeah, it was. Um, it was. You, like, I just can't remember what she said, and I, I was thinking like, honestly, it, and I can't picture. see. So this is a great example for anyone tuning in of like. So it's a fabulous picture of the fruit, but like if there were, if this also had flowers that were actively blooming, that would be a fabulous thing to take a photo of, also. And I really can't oh, cool. see the leaves here at all. Um, I guess hmm. I can see the stem. 
And iNaturalist really allows you to sort of, you can zoom in when you're, when you're online, especially and zoom into photos and make things lighter or darker to help try to get things um, as, as close as you can. So the leaves are tricky to see. Honestly, at first glance, I mean, to me, this looks just like a tomato, but I-, I Yeah, understand. it probably is. Plus pumpkins don't grow that high up, but- <laughs> Maybe it's some sort of pumpkin, pumpkin tomato cultivar. Uh, yeah, really something nice. pumpkin-y, tomato-y. Because it also does, she has a cage, there's a cage maybe around it? Maybe not. Anyway, so this I is- I can't a, tell, a, I don't think so. Cool, so like in, you know, in the future, Take yeah. pictures of a thing, and if you're going to add a time and address that sort of showcases more of the story of what it is, and that would help somebody who does know say, Oh, for sure, this is a cool tomato of some kind. Yeah, cool. Um, I don't know. I'm sorry, I can't be more helpful. I like, I know like, that's I'm okay. Really, I'm not maybe someone, maybe, yeah, well, Greta can definitely identify it for me, like in this instance, but, uh, well, but and you know, and really, again, for pe- if anyone, you know, people are still with us and they're interested in iNaturalist stuff, that's a fabulous example of the kind of like the, that's the kind of observation that shows up on iNaturalist a lot someone took a picture they're like I don't know what this is yeah if you happen to know you're a fabulous candidate for being on iNaturalist to help people verify uh what they're seeing uh, and it's yeah a, bit of a fun thing to kind of get into and, it is and especially even if you were to right now go on iNatur- iNaturalist on their website and search for bees in Utah you'll see that a lot of the observations made are not up to research grade quality a lot of the photos are fabulous um I am not an expert enough in D's to be able to make IDs, but I suspect there are people engaging in the festival who do know. And so you really could help and be a citizen scientist in that way by contributing your knowledge uh, about stuff. Um, so yeah. whether it's helping Sophie identify tomatoes or it's helping <laughs> people in the state uh, identify the bees that they're seeing, um, that's awesome. And you know, again, I will say, since we're on the topic, if you're somebody who's making IDs and you see someone who took a photo that's like not, all the information that you need. As I said, people have mentioned that to me and it helped me then become a better I, I observer of things. And so don't be shy to say great photos. It would be helpful if, you know, X, Y, and Z was also present next time you see this. Um, right. Or if you see something that's cool and in the comments saying, whoa, this is a cool bee or I don't usually see this photograph or wow, take pictures of this if you see them again. Um, that that's really exciting for users too. And people have done that to me as well. And it just kind of, it fuels the fire. It's sort of, it's like when you play golf and you have one great hit every once in a while, it helps you keep playing. Yeah. <laughs> anyone, well, if any of you get that analogy. <laughs> um, speaking of, you know, like hitting it, you know, hitting it out of the park, that's a baseball analogy. I don't, I don't have any golf analogies, um, but uh you know, one of the questions that was just asked on the chat is, um, I mean, maybe from what you've expo- experienced on looking through iNaturalist, um, what are some of the coolest observations you've made or you've seen other people make um, in Salt Lake City that just blew your mind and you didn't expect to see here? <laughs> That's a great question. So I, I can speak, I mean, there are many, uh, yeah. honestly, that people have made that are amazing and I don't know about all of them. I will personally, things that I've made that have sort of surprised me. They're, they're both actually spider observations. One was a, a spider that I photographed in my backyard. It's called a, a feather legged spider. And oh, cool. um, it's something that's on the record, like the official record of species that exist in the state of Utah, but it's not often photographed on iNaturalist, for example. And so there aren't a lot of current records of them existing here. Um, and Rebecca Ray, the, the um, amazing citizen scientist that I was mentioning to you earlier, um, I was showing her a picture of one and she was like, wait a second, this is in your yard? And she was so excited about it because she, as a spider expert, had really, had only ever seen them herself um, when she was in Southern Utah, taking part in a separate bio blitz and found that, found one herself. And that was, uh, I think the only record of one on iNaturalist at the time. And so now there are several from my own yard. Um, right here in the city. And so she was like, oh, they're here. So that was exciting for me because she was really excited about it. And actually, um, fairly recently, I was uh, safely visiting some family in Colorado and um, made another spider observation. And, and, uh, and someone who I do not know was like, whoa, <laughs> this is a first record of this species in the state. Uh, it's not even supposed to be here. And it was oh. just kind of crawling around uh, at a building that I happened to be visiting. And I was like, oh, it was a jumping spider. And I was like, oh, a jumping spider. Um, <laughs> I took a picture of it. Um, spiders are something that I used to sort of feel pretty squeamish about, uh, as Rebecca did, yeah. um, Rebecca Ray. Uh, but really, the more you learn about them, the more you sort of observe them and photograph them, like, you realize they're really not that 
scary. They're pretty amazing. And of course, spiders do a lot of wonderful things for, for the environment and for, for the world in general. Um, but now when I see them, I'm like, ooh, and I tend to go photograph them. And so my family knows that when we're on hikes and I see stuff that, you know, if I'm not, if I'm not behind them anymore, it's because I found something that I'm photographing and I'll catch up eventually. <laughs> Um, but spiders definitely are something that I, I have really found to enjoy photographing. And spiders do have some unique features that you need to um, maybe pay attention to photographing as well. And we also have a little resource uh, link on our website at the Natural History Museum of how to make quality spider observations on iNaturalist um, that I developed in conjunction with Rebecca and Christy Bills and others. Um, Again, just to help cool. make observations as good as you can so they can be identifiable. Anyway, so those are some examples of things recently that other people on the site were excited about that, you know, again, I took the photo. I was like, oh, I see this thing. I'm taking a picture. I had no idea. And then other people were like, these are interesting. Um, and that, that happens on iNaturalist a fair amount. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I just found the, well, I think I found the page on uh, your guys' site for spider spider observations. There's a, oh, there's a lot on here. I'm going to, I'm going to throw that in the chat just so people. Sure. Yeah. We have a whole little spider page from some summer programming we did. Um, and there is, yeah, you did spider fest, right? Or I mean that maybe that's separate. Yes. We did partner with Antelope Island and their annual spider fest uh, <laughs> event, which happened in, in August. It happens every yeah. August. So tune in next year. Uh, it's always out on Antelope Island, but we did host a big bio blitz um, to record spiders in the state. Um, and so, yeah, the link that I think you're looking at has a great recording of a conversation I, I had with Rebecca about, you know, spiders and iNaturalist and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then there's also a, I can share this link with you specifically, Sophie, um, a doc that talks about, you know, how to make spider observations. And actually, I've got one in the works um, for bees, too. So that'll be a link soon on our website as well. Sweet. Sweet. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. This has been so informative and I feel really excited and less um, timid about becoming a citizen scientist because <laughs> I think what really keeps people, you know, from just jumping right in is that you feel behind the curve or you feel um like you know i don't know how to even id anything so where do i even start but it's it's cool to learn that you can just go and start looking at other people's observations first and yeah. start just learning from learning from other people and you know starting where you're at and going for it that's totally right and and i'll say it again like whatever you're seeing is is interesting and so if you even if you don't know or think that it's an interesting thing it really might be to a researcher now or you know, in 10 years from now. And so the whole purpose of iNaturalist is to capture biodiversity records of specific things in specific places at specific times. And you, you're, when you're out and you're on a walk, you're in your yard, you're seeing something that someone else isn't, isn't gonna see again in that moment. And so it's kind of a cool thing to think about. Um, and you really can be the eyes and the, photogra the photographic eyes for science. Um, and that's that's fun, but really also it's just a fun thing. Like I said, a great excuse to get outside and learn a little bit more about the nature all around you, which is pretty fun. Um, and you know, as a plug for what's going on later today, uh, my colleague at the museum, Christy Bills, has a talk that's going to be airing pretty soon, talking about native bees in the state of Utah. So you can learn a little bit more about the bees we've got living here. Um, and then she's also presenting with Amanda Barth, who heads a citizen science project looking at bumblebees and milkweed in the state of Utah um, through, with the Wild Utah Project, which is another wonderful partner of the museums. And they do amazing citizen science projects. And so I highly recommend you tune into that too, because that's another fun way to be engaged in some specific bee citizen science research. Yeah, that, it's a great talk. Um, that will be third in the lineup today. Um, I'm excited to see that again. Um, well, Ellen, thanks so much. I think we answered everyone's questions um, in the Thank chat. If, if anyone else has any questions, we, we can answer it throughout the fest. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll hit you up, Ellen, and be like, hey, we have some urgent questions. Um, everyone's at the edge of their seats. 
we need more answers. Um, <laughs> Please do, and you know, people are welcome to email me if they've got questions about citizen science as well. And also, okay, also yeah. What's your email? Should I do? Should I drop it in the? Well, I mean, you're searchable. I'm. Um, you, it's like yeah, you can find me. Yeah, you can find me on the Natural History Museum's website. I'm the citizen science coordinator, Ellen Erickson. And I'm happy to talk with you about citizen science at any point. It's something that I am very passionate about, um, and that includes anyone who's interested in partnering potentially starting a citizen science project, uh, I really am all ears. And so I'm happy to chat with people. Because um, like I said, it's all about the power of community. Citizen science needs you. So thanks yeah. everyone for contributing. And if you feel inspired or even a little bit inspired, download iNaturalist for free on your phone or just check it out online. And this afternoon, it's gorgeous. Give yourself an excuse to go outside find some pollinators hanging out on whatever flowers you can find left or buzzing around in the dirt um, or any other cool things you happen to see. Post a picture to a naturalist today and see how it goes. It's pretty fun. And I think really you just have to start by making an observation and see where it takes you. I'm almost up to a thousand observations myself. Some people have many, many more than that. And it's pretty, it's, it's become sort of an addiction for me in a really, I think good and healthy way, especially in these times where I've <laughs> had to be inside a lot. And it's gotten me outside to hang out with nature in some pretty meaningful ways. So I'm grateful for that. Awesome. Thank you everybody in advance for your contributions. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. It was so great having you on B-Fest today. Thanks for helping us get it started. Woohoo. Um, yeah, the celebration of pollination continues. So Hooray. yeah. Hooray. Hooray. Well, I'm going to go outside, take a couple of pictures. I'll be right seeing on. Alan I naturalist. So yeah. Have a great day. <laughs> you too. Thanks again, Alan. We'll see you later. Thanks, everybody. Take care. All right, everybody.